Welcome everyone to Guilty Minds, a virtual conference on mens rea and criminal justice reform. My name is Michael Sirota. I'm a criminal law professor at ASU's Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law. I'm also an associate deputy director of the Law School's Academy for Justice. The Academy is focused on bridging the gap between criminal justice reform and those working on criminal justice reform on the ground. This conference is right at the heart of the Academy's mission because our objective on September 25th and 26th is to discuss whether the topic of mens rea, Latin for guilty mind, has a place in our national conversation over criminal justice reform. With these opening remarks, I'm gonna explain why I think this is a discussion worth having, but first I'm gonna provide some relevant background to help frame the conference. So this conference is being convened at a pretty perilous time for our nation's criminal justice system. Every morning, about 2.2 million people wake up in state or federal prison while another 6.6 .6 million people continue living their lives under some form of correctional supervision. This makes America the world leader in incarceration. But the situation is even worse than these numbers suggest because each year, many millions more cycle in and out of our criminal justice system. This floods courts, jails, and probation offices. What remains is a country where about one out of every three adults possesses a criminal record. So we know this has serious societal costs. It destroys lives, families, and communities. And we also know that these costs are concentrated on those who can least bear it, the poor, underserved, and communities of color. The criminal justice system often views these vulnerable populations as objects to be controlled, rather than people who deserve to be treated fairly and humanely. Of course, not everyone in our politically polarized country sees it this way. But after this summer's catastrophic events, the numbers of those who doubt these disparities are likely dwindling. A global pandemic continues to rage through our nation's overstuffed prisons. And there's a seemingly endless litany of unjustified killings of people of color by law enforcement. Raw footage of these heinous acts has opened the eyes of many to just how unequal our nation's criminal justice system actually is. These moments and many others demand reflection. Does everyone in prison really deserve to or need to be there? Can the wide net of criminal liability created by our bloated criminal codes be justified? Many people, I think, would say no, that we rely too much on the criminal justice system to deal with our social problems. So what we need right now is less punishment and less incarceration. But what conduct are we prepared to decriminalize? And which punishments are we willing to shorten? The easy answer is low-level nonviolent offenses. But that says little about most of the people we incarcerate. Because the vast majority of people in prison are there for serious offenses, things like homicide, assault, and drug trafficking. Any meaningful attempt at rolling back mass incarceration will need to address these populations as well. But how realistic is this? Well, the politics of shortening sentences for these types of offenses is complicated. Many of us may celebrate lawmakers who embrace the smart on crime lens, but the political risks of being pegged as soft on crime are still very real. So what we are left with is a groundswell of support for criminal justice reform in the abstract, but comparatively little to show for in terms of concrete policy accomplishments. So is there a place for mens rea reform in this picture or in the future of criminal justice reform? Maybe, maybe not. That's the question at the heart of this event. My hope is that the conference will shed some light on it. But with the rest of these opening remarks, I'd like to explain why I think the question is the least one worth asking. So here are the main bullet points. First, a significant number of criminal statutes and sentencing policies authorize punishment to be imposed without regard to the defendant's mental state. Second, this strongly indicates that some proportion of the people we sentence for even the most serious crimes are morally innocent of what they're being punished for. And third, this is true even though these people in some sense did the very thing the criminal law told them not to do, like killing, injuring, or distributing narcotics. To make sense of these ideas, we need to consider that there are two general ingredients of every crime, culpability and wrongdoing, or what the US Supreme Court has described as an evil meaning mind and an evil doing hand. Some number of people we send to prison every year are innocent because they lack the second ingredient. They didn't do the bad act that the government charged them with. A jury, or more likely the judge, determined that the defendant pulled the trigger of the gun, threw the punch, or distributed the drugs. 
but this conclusion was wrong on the facts. Someone else actually did it. And because of that, we sent an innocent person to prison. So false convictions based on factual innocence are unsettling. And when they arise, they ought to shake our confidence in the criminal justice system. But they're not the only form of false conviction because it's also possible for someone who performed the bad act the law charged them with and yet still be innocent of that charge. That's possible because a criminal judgment expresses something that a civil judgment doesn't, moral condemnation. To be convicted of a crime is to be told that you failed to live up to society's moral expectations and therefore deserve the communal approbation and suffering that comes with being labeled a felon. But whether that's actually true depends upon more than someone's having done the wrong thing. It also depends upon what they were thinking when they did it. For example, imagine hearing that Jane knocked John off the 10th story of a balcony, sending John plummeting to his death. Trag tragic event for sure. But does Jane deserve to be convicted of homicide? Well, that depends upon what was going on in her mind. If Jane's an adult who, tended to, who intended to kill John for her own enjoyment, well, then she's a murderer who deserves to be punished. But there are many other things that might have been happening. For example, what if Jane accidentally tripped over a poorly placed trash can, in which case she had no idea she might harm John? Or perhaps someone had spiked Jane's drink, making it all but impossible for an involuntarily drunken Jane to stop herself from stumbling into John. Or perhaps a sober Jane intended to push John off the balcony but mistakenly thought John was about to kill her along with everyone else on the balcony. Or perhaps Jane didn't know that pushing John off the balcony was morally wrongful or would cause John harm in any event because maybe Jane was suffering from a developmental disorder or psychotic delusions. In all these situations, Jane's conduct is surely wrongful and clearly regrettable. But because of Jane's state of mind, her conduct arguably isn't blameworthy in any meaningful sense in which case it would be unjust and likely inefficient for the criminal justice system to allow Jane to be punished for it. And yet, the criminal law quite often does just this, authorizing morally innocent people like Jane to be punished, often severely. For example, criminal codes not infrequently deny the relevance of things like accidents, mistakes, mental illness, coercion, and other morally relevant psychological criteria to the threshold decision of whether to convict someone of a crime. Even more frequently, the criminal law denies the relevance of these kinds of psychological criteria to the punishments it hands out. Instead of carefully calibrating sentences with an individualized assessment of a person's state of mind, it applies a blunt in for a penny, in for a pound approach that treats the least culpable just as harshly as the most intentional wrongdoers. For example, consider the situation of a young Florida man named Ryan Hall who was sentenced to life in prison for a homicide committed by someone else. Mr. Hall had no intention to facilitate that homicide. Indeed, he wasn't even at the scene of the crime. All Mr. Hall did was lend a car to his group of friends who he thought might use it to steal a safe from a drug dealer's home. And that's what this group did as Mr. Hall slept. But then things took a fatal turn when one of the home's residents resisted. Based upon Mr. Hall's unwitting aid of a homicide, Florida's felony murder doctrine allowed him to be punished just as severely as the person who intentionally killed the victim, which is what happened. Both Mr. Hall and the principal actor received the same sentence, life without the possibility of parole. And this is just one of many examples of an injustice that occurs inside and outside of the homicide context, because we have a number of policies in this country that treat accidental accomplices to any other serious crime from getaway drivers to supportive spouses and parents, just as harshly as those who intentionally perpetrate those crimes themselves. So the existence of these kinds of policies call into question the moral guilt of those we convict of and punish for committing even the most serious offenses in our criminal codes. And to the extent we are punishing the morally innocent, it seems relatively clear who it is that's bearing the brunt of these injustices. The poor, the underserved, and people of color who desperately suffer from every other problem in our criminal justice system. Of course, with a criminal justice system in crisis, it's fair to question whether men's rare reform should be a top priority right now. At the very least, 
I think it's clear that focusing on the guilty mind is not going to unravel mass incarceration or eliminate structural racism from our criminal justice system. But that's also true of just about every other politically realistic criminal justice reform proposal being discussed right now. And men's ray reform happens to have a number of things going for it that many other topics don't. For example, it's connected with our intuitive sense of justice. It's also aligned with some of our nation's shared moral values. And it offers the promise of narrowing liability for even very serious crimes in a just and equitable way. But look, ultimately, the question of whether the law of guilty minds should be made an important piece of reform efforts is one that I'm going to leave for the conference. All that I want to like, all that I want to impart with these opening remarks is the importance of asking it. Because there's no justification for excluding the morally innocent from our national conversation over criminal justice reform. So come, join me, the Academy for Justice, and some of the nation's leading criminal law scholars and practitioners as we discuss the law of guilty minds on September 25th and 26th.